<laughs> um, I hope you all have your coffee and you're ready for an exciting day. Uh, welcome to day two of Global Plant Forward. And I uh, just want to say hello to the people joining us uh, from around the world, hopefully, um, through our webcast. I would like to thank Better Balance and the National Peanut Board for sponsoring breakfast and um, have a, a, a little bit of an apology uh, because I think yesterday I created a minor scandal when I, when you watched Chef Keisha Griggs cook her curry jackfruit, you smelled it, and then I said, you're gonna go out and get it, and you didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, but it will be available at lunch today. So, so sometimes I'm up here and uh, doing this, and my brain is five steps ahead, and uh, I misspoke. So, um, but it's exciting stuff. You're still gonna get that. Um, but so we have a, a really exciting day ahead. Uh, after this culinary demo by East of Belfridge, we have a panel on regional grain systems. Uh, we have a conversation uh, with folks from Bon Appetit Management Company and UC Davis Medical System on uh, making uh, plant forward changes within big institutions. And then in the afternoon, we get into our breakout sessions. So uh, make sure that you remember to follow along in the app. You can get presentations uh, and um, recipes there. So now I um, am pleased to introduce East of Belfridge. Um, in the gastronomical me, the food writer MFK Fisher offers the following. Quote, it seems to me that our three basic needs for food and security and love are so mixed and mingled and entwine that we cannot straightly think of one without the others. So it happens that when I write of hunger, I am really writing about love and the hunger for it, and warmth and the love of it and the hunger for it, and then the warmth and richness and fine reality of hunger satisfied, and it is all one." End quote. Fisher was known for sensual prose that brought food alive in a way that allowed the reader to be unabashedly passionate about eating. When perusing through Mezcla Recipes to Excite, the new cookbook by East of Belfridge, one gets that same sense, that food serves many purposes beyond satiety, chiefly sensuality and celebration. Her recipes for the column The New Vegan in The Guardian are proof that vegan cooking can be every bit as delicious and craveable as menus full of meat. And Mezcla might be the perfect cookbook for Global Plant Forward, as 60% of the recipes are veg forward. This is a book for vegans, vegetarians, and flexitarians alike who are in pursuit of flavor first. Her approach is big, bold, and creative, bolstered by the many hours that she spends testing and retesting recipes to come up with the perfect combination of flavors, colors, and employing techniques honed from her five years in the Otolenghi Test Kitchen and as the co-author of Otolenghi Flavor. We are absolutely honored to have East of Belfridge kick off day two of Global Plant Forward with a culinary demo, so please help me welcome her. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I, I love that quote by MFK Fisher. I'm gonna to have to look that up. That was really beautiful and a really uh, great way to describe what food means to me and I'm sure what food means to all of you as well. It's it's not just about fuel. I mean, obviously, that's very important, but it's, it's about love, it's about color, it's about creativity, um, it's about using your imagination. Um, and that's what my book really is all about. It's about harnessing your creativity. And obviously, if you were to cook through my book, I would hope that you'd find recipes that you'd want to cook over and over again. But more than that, I kind of would want you to just be inspired by different combinations, maybe combinations that you might might think are a little weird or um, you might not have come up with and then to come up with your own so that's really what what my book is about um, and what that subtitle uh, recipes to excite is all about so um, today I'm showing you three uh, plant-based well not plant-based yes three plant-based recipes one one of them have optional butter and cheese but obviously that's to taste um, and you can use them or not so uh, the first recipe I'm going to do is roasted and raw cabbage salad. So this uh, salad actually features Napa cabbage, which um, I didn't really 
think about until now as quite a, a point for, for the day. Although apparently in the US you have two peas in Napa cabbage. In England, there's just one piece. So anyway, um, the great thing about this salad is that it features raw and roasted cabbage. So with every bite, you get a mix of uh, fresh crunch um, and like sweet, soft char. Because um, I'll just, where's the roasted cabbage? Um, I'll just show you what it looks like once you've roasted it. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you so much. So this is what it looks like once you've roasted it and it's, um, it's crunchy and it really brings out that sweetness and those bitter notes, kind of like caramelly. Um, and what I'm gonna do with uh, this cabbage here is just kind of massage it. So in the original recipe, we've got things made ahead here because um, well, because we have to. Um, in the original recipe, you would massage um, a Napa cabbage, separate the leaves, massage them all up until that uh, oil and salt really help to sort of break down the cabbage. Um, excuse the hands. <laughs> um, and then half of it, we're going to roast for about sort of 10 to 12 minutes, and you'll get what you see there. And the other half, we're going to keep nice and fresh to get that crunch. Um, now, what I really love about this salad uh, is, like I said before, the, the, the juxtaposition between the, the sweet, soft char and the fresh crunch. Um, and this is really something that I... Oh, thank you so much. This is really something that I learned at the Otolenghi Test Kitchen. Um, Yotam always taught us that the best way to make a dish shine is for it to have layers and layers of flavours and textures. So this salad... Um, is really all about layers. So you'll see when I build it, it kind of, it'll look like a volcano. Um, and we've got the charred, uh, the charred uh, cabbage, the fresh cabbage. We've got crunchy spring onions, crunchy apples, soft herbs, and this salsa. So, well, in the recipe I call it a dressing, but it's really more of a salsa. So we're gonna mix together some fresh chopped cherry tomatoes, some red bell pepper flakes, um, you could also use, um, add some chilies to this. In fact, I'm kind of wondering why I didn't add chilies because I add chilies to everything, but that's the recipe. Um, so maple syrup goes in for a bit of sweetness, a bit of tomato paste uh, to give it that concentrated tomato flavor, uh, fresh chopped garlic, olive oil, and then we've got both lemon juice and lime juice. Um, you'll find that in a lot of my recipes, I use both. Um, when I worked at the Otolenghi Test Kitchen, I remember Yotam used to always say, kind of, we always used to have to decide whether the, a dish was a lemon dish or a lime dish. And I, I, I think everything he says is pretty much gold, but that was one thing that I kind of didn't really agree with because I think that both can bring such different things to the party. Um, so you'll find in my book that a lot of recipes have both lemon and lime. I find lemon is a bit more sort of floral and fruity, whereas lime is, you know, it has more, more acidity, um, and yeah, they just bring different things to the party. In fact, there's quite a few recipes in my book where I use lemon, lime, and tangerine um, because I just love those together. So that's, that's the dressing made already. And this is a really great thing to use. I mean, it's great as a dressing. It's also, it pretty much works as a salsa. So you could put this on tacos, serve it with roasted veg, serve it with roasted meats, um, anything like that. Um, and yeah, it's just a pretty simple salad once you've, once you've roasted the veg. So what I'm going to do now is construct it. Um, so I'll grab a platter. Which one am I using? I've forgotten. This one. Okay. So I'm going to use a bowl because with this salad, I want it to sort of, I want to build it up like a volcano, like I said. So we're going to start with um, do you have the, the massage cabbage. Oh, thank you. No worries. So um, with this, you kind of build it into levels. So with every bite, you have a little bit of the raw, a little bit of the chard, a bit of apple, a bit of spring onion, um, and then you kind of layer it with the salsa. Um, so yeah, just grab that. Oh, where was the other one that I did? Oh, it's gone into the oven. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I'll just put a little bit of oil into there as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alrighty, so I'm going to start with a layer of the raw cabbage. 
top that with a layer of the roasted cabbage and then going to dress it with some of that salsa or dressing, whatever you want to call it. And then, oh, sorry, some spring onions, um, some apples or pears, whatever you've got, uh, well, whatever you've got, whatever you prefer, really, or a mix of both. Um, some herbs. And then I'm just going to keep building up those layers um, until I have like a nice, a beautiful mountain of salad. And like I said, it should be just like a really fun, it's a fun way of eating because every bite um, has something a little different. I, I'm not a massive fan of salads that are completely dressed. Um, so, you know, for example, a Caesar salad, when it's completely dressed in a Caesar dressing, that's not really for me because I feel like then that makes every bite the same. Um, I kind of like dressings to be layered throughout or on the bottom or just sort of splodged around, which is a very sort of classic um, Ottolenghi thing as well, because um, that means that every bite will be different, every bite will be exciting, it will have different textures, it won't just be sort of cloyingly dressed. Um, anyway, that's my personal preference. Um, so that's kind of always, I generally would order a salad with, with dressing on the side. Um, okay, so we're almost done with that. Starting to look like a beautiful volcano already. And I'm just going to keep going until I run out. And it's kind of going to look like a tottering... Well, actually, you know what? I'm not going to keep going because I usually would have done it maybe in a slightly bigger on a slightly bigger pasta, so if I keep going with all that, it will, but that, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so, finish it with the rest of the salsa and have that sort of dripping round, like a beautiful, God, if I say volcano again, I'm gonna, ring up there. I have to say it again. I'm actually named after a volcano, so maybe that's why I'm like obsessed with volcanoes. So finish it off with a tumble of spring onion, a tumble of herbs, some, apple or pear or whatever and then totally optional but i like to finish it off with um some gratings of either pecorino or parmesan pecorino is really nice if you can get hold of that um i'm not getting very there we go so obviously this is this is just as delicious without it so it can very easily be a plant-based salad um sorry it's pretty much going all over the side not onto the actual salad um, there we go. And then I would always finish my salads with another little drizzle of oil. There's oil in the, in the salsa as well, but I'm obsessed with olive oil, so I want plenty of it. And there we have it, my roasted and raw cabbage salad. I don't know what you can see. Oh, I'll just leave it there. I was going to move it over there. Uh, with a lemon and lime and tomato salsa. We've got crunchy apples. We've got crunchy spring onions basil for freshness and just a, it'll be a really nice bunch of textures in every bite. Okay, cool. So I think we're going to move on to the celeriac or as you guys call it, celery root. I'm actually really surprised, I have to say, because I had this, uh, I, I just assumed that everything in the US would be so much bigger. So in, in the UK, our regular celeriacs are about this big, I'd say. So I just assumed that I'd get here and there would be like a, a celery root this big. <laughs> but actually, uh, this is the biggest one I think that you had. So um, I don't know if you can see this roasted guy is absolutely tiny, super cute. So in the, in the recipe, which I think you guys have access to, um, I say that you should roast the celery root for, I think I say two and a half to three and a half hours, but it really just depends on the size. I think these ones, how long did these take, these small ones? Like an, an hour. So, yeah, keep an eye on it. What you're looking for... So first, you want to take off these hairy roots or shoots or whatever they are <laughs> um, and give it a nice scrub. But keep the skin on because the skin is full of flavour, it's full of nutrients. Um, and I'm just... I'm not really a big fan of taking the skin off things if it's not necessary. Obviously, if it's grown with loads of pesticides and, or whatever, then, yeah, wash it and... But yeah, I am telling you to wash it. Just don't take that skin off because it's really flavorful. Just take all these gnarly bits off. So once you've done that, give it a little scrub, cover it with oil and salt, and stick it in the oven and just 
just let it go until this is what you're looking for. You're looking for a soft, I don't know if you can see how soft it is when I squash it, um, uh, caramelized outside. And what will actually also happen, something very beautiful will happen, you'll get this incredible celeriac, celery root caramel that kind of will seep out of the celeriac. And that will depend on, I guess, how much liquid or starch or whatever is in your actual celeriac. So sometimes I've made this recipe and I get loads of this caramel and I can easily chop it up and cover the pieces in that caramel. I'm calling it a caramel for want of another word. Um, and sometimes there'll be hardly any. So in the event that you don't have much, um, I, once I chop the celeriac up, I toss it with a bit of honey or a bit of maple syrup and then get it back into the oven just to ca caramelize the cut sides. So that's the celeriac or celery root. And we're now going to make a little dressing for that salad. Now, actually, again, let me go back to explaining what this dish is. So it is roasted celeriac with pickled celeriac. Again, like I was saying before, um, I'm a very big fan of combining. Um, it, it gets very exciting if you combine a vegetable in, in two different forms. So this has pickled raw, crunchy, and, and soft caramelized roasted elements. Um, and it makes it interesting enough that it can become like, it can take center stage in a vegetable forward feast. Um, that's, I think, the whole point of cooking vegetables like this is to make them so exciting that you kind of don't really miss the meat. So that's what this dish is. It's roasted celeriac topped with pickled celeriac, um, also pickled celery. So the, the pickles I've made with a, a mix of lime juice, rice vinegar, or any sort of white vinegar. Um, lime peel and some smashed up garlic cloves um, and then so that's going to go on top of the roasted and then we're going to dress it with a beautiful sort of sweet soy dressing so for that I'm just going to see if I can work this out no there we go front it actually says front on it I should just read um, so we're going to go in with a bit of oil um, some garlic some red chilies and a couple of star anise to get that really nice and aromatic. So I'm just going to let that go for a little bit. I'm trying to think what I can say now. <laughs> um, so actually, yeah, in the, in the original recipes, yeah, actually something that I want to say is that we're always learning, and I think that's the most beautiful part about cooking. I personally don't think many of you might disagree with this, but I personally don't think there should be any rules when it comes to cooking. And I respect that there is a science behind cooking, but that's not necessarily how I want to cook. I prefer to sort of go with the flow and let flavor guide me. So I'm not too worried about like, this is how this should be done and this is what should be happening here. I'm kind of just thinking like, does it work? Does it taste delicious? And if so, great. Um, so that's kind of how I cook. I'm, not, I'm absolutely not saying that's the right way of doing it. I'm just saying I'm not classically trained. I didn't go to school, so that's just that's how I do it naturally. But because of that, um, I've, I've been writing, writing recipes for like six, seven years now. Um, and like I said before, we're always learning. And something that you've written down in a book four years ago maybe, just because you wrote it down doesn't mean it's necessarily the, the best way of doing it. So... This recipe is from Flavor, which I co-authored with um, Ottolenghi. And in that recipe, I said to start with very hot oil and then put the garlic and the chili in. And then we were talking earlier, and it actually makes a lot more sense to start with cold oil and let that come up so you don't sort of burn the garlic before the chili becomes crispy. So, um, yeah, humility in cooking and having an open, just being open to learning new things and to things changing. I'm actually going to turn this a little bit lower. This is such a fancy stove. I love it. Um, so just going to let that go. And I've, to be honest, if I was to write this recipe again, I'd probably add a cinnamon stick to this. I might add some ginger as well. Um, so, you know, feel free to use recipes as a blueprint. Um, I always say that when I write a recipe, it's, it's for everyone. There are some people like myself who absolutely hate cooking from recipes. I never cook from recipes, so I kind of, I'm always very grateful that people actually do cook my recipes because I really don't like cooking from recipes. But I really respect that some people do. Um, then there are people, perhaps like yourselves, who, who, who really know how to cook, so who might just look at a recipe 
as a source of inspiration. You might just look at the title, you might just look at the picture, you might just read the introduction, kind of get a sense for the recipe and then just kind of do your own thing. Um, and I, I think that's a really great thing. I think a recipe can be whatever you want it to be. If you're not a confident cook, you can use it as a blueprint and you can, sorry, you can use it precisely and follow every instruction um, and hopefully you'll come up with something pretty, pretty perfect. Um, and if you're a more confident cook, you can just use it as inspiration. Um, so I really do think recipes are for everyone. Cookbooks, I think, are definitely for everyone. I have so many cookbooks and I never cook from any of them, but I adore looking through them. I love looking at the pictures. I love reading about people's stories, um, about you know, why they were inspired to make a certain dish, but you're not gonna find me like actually cooking from a recipe. I get so frustrated. Um, so yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you, what I always say about the way I develop recipes is it's not the way I cook. So there's different modes. So when you're writing a recipe, you're in a very sort of formulaic mode. Um, and I'm actually just going to strain this now because it'll keep on frying. Um, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so take it out before it gets too dark because garlic especially keeps on, keeps on going after you've taken it out of the oil. So that's kind of at a good place for me. I'm just gonna sprinkle it with a bit of salt and then I'm gonna answer your question. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's two very different modes. When I'm, when I'm developing a recipe, um, I time everything, I write everything down. I'm, I'm in a much more sort of formulaic mode. And then when I have the time to sort of really enjoy cooking, it's, compl it's a completely different thing. I'll just be sort of grabbing things, shoving them in and like with, I mean, that's how I love to cook. I mean, I love, I love developing recipes and I feel very grateful that I've um, I actually do this for a job, it doesn't really seem real, but it's not the same as just cooking with sort of, with abandon and just having the freedom to put whatever you want in. What was your question again? <laughs> Sorry. You, oh, there we go. Okay, everyone's up now. Um, uh, no, you answered it. I okay. Mean, it's just this, it's, um, you know, I'm thinking about the cookbook, and you you go through all of those recipes, mm. and they're so vibrant. And you can you can tell it, there's a lot going on, but you're able. So there's the creative side of you, mm. but I know that um, you know, as with any kind of creative person, there's also the sort of structured, the kind of techniques and things mm. that you do, and so it's just that kind of thing where you know, wondering where you sort of. Uh, let the creative side take you, and then the, the sort of structured testing side comes back and, you know. Yeah, I mean, so the, the structured testing side is I have, I have Ottolenghi to thank for, for teaching me that. When I, when I first worked in, when I first started at the test kitchen, I'd never written a recipe before. I had no idea what I was doing. And as some of you may know, Ottolenghi recipes are extremely precise. They're very long. They're very detailed, like down to the eighth of a teaspoon, down to the sort of second. Um, sometimes we literally will be like fry this for like 15 seconds and people are like come on um, but then we'll also tell you like until you know soft and golden or whatever um, so that element of it is very much something that I learnt um, it's not something that's inherent to me it, it still feels I'm, I kind of do it on autopilot now because I've written recipes for so long but it still feels a bit it's not it's not the way I would it's not the way I would cook if I if I wasn't doing it for work <laughs> but I do think it's a, a great job as jobs go. Um, so to finish off this dressing for our celeriac, we're going to add some of the oil, which should be nice and fragrant. It should be sort of gingery and star anise and chili -y. Um And then to that, we're going to add some sesame seeds. Make sure you toast them really well before you put them in. Um, we're also going to add some rice vinegar, some soy sauce, some maple syrup and some chives give that a really nice mix and again this is 
a beautiful dressing that you can use in so many different contexts, not just in this recipe. Um, in flavor, we actually have a whole section at the back where we talk about flavor bombs, and that's the idea that all these dressings and salsas and sauces that you make are not just for that recipe. Like, it, try it with that recipe, see how it is, and then use your ima imagination to, to come up with other ways of using it. So, I mean, this would be great with fried tofu, it would be great with any type of roasted veg, it would be really delicious spooned over fish. It would, you know, you could add lots more things to it. You could add chopped fresh chilies, chopped dried chilies, um, and use it as a kind of like taco topper. I mean, it, it, there's just so many options for it. So, let's build this salad. So we've got the roasted celeriac, which I'm gonna, which I'm still trying to get over how small things are here. I really, I'm really surprised. I really thought they would be huge. Um, a quarter of a celeriac in England is probably like this size. Um, but now that's actually the beautiful thing about vegetables is they are all unique and we shouldn't be looking for uniformity. Um, in this day and age, we should be letting you know, vegetables grow the way they want to without too much, you know, trying to make them what they are, just let them shine. So it's good that they're all different. So we've got that on the bottom. I'm now gonna, oh, no. What am I going to do? No, that goes on top. Okay, so I'm going to dress them with this beautiful dressing. And then, oh my God, I actually haven't made this recipe in a long time and I've kind of forgotten how much I love it. Okay, so now I'm going to top it with that pickled celeriac, which also has some pickled celery as well. And really, what we're doing here is just trying to make a vegetable dish so exciting that people are like, oh, where's the meat? I mean, don't get me wrong, I, love, I'm, I am very much an omnivore. I do, I love meat and I love fish. I, I really am trying to do my best to eat less of it. Um, and the best way to do that is to, to just make vegetables extra tasty. So now we're gonna go on with some spring onions, some Thai basil, which is just so beautifully aromatic. And then we're gonna finish it off with these crispy aromatics. Just take out the star anise because no one wants to be chomping on those. Well, actually, some people do. Um, and there we go. So again, there's so many different textures in every bite here. There's that soft caramelized celeriac. The, the dressing has those little bits of sesame seed and chives. You've got those soft herbs, the crunchy pickles and the crunchy little crispy bits. So every, every mouthful should feel like a bit like a party. Feel like a bit like a party? You know what I mean. <laughs> okay, cool. So, wow, you're so organized, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so next we are gonna make, uh, well I'm gonna make, uh, kohlrabi with a miso munier. So this recipe is inspired by a recipe I wrote in Flavor, which was for celeriac with Café de Paris sauce. So again, the idea here is to treat the vegetable like the star. Um, and and I, I like the idea of putting a sauce that you would classically use with, with fish or meat and pairing it with a vegetable. So obviously, a meunier you'd usually have with fish. Um, a Café de Paris you'd maybe have with steak or something like that. So this is just a really fun way of making the vegetable the star of, of a dish that you would associate with meat. So we're gonna, so what we do here, again, these kohlrabi are so much smaller than the ones we have in England. <laughs> so in the recipe I say, so I toss it with oil and salt, lay it on a baking sheet, and then I say in the recipe roast for about 50 to 55 minutes. These actually only took about 20 minutes, is that right? Because they're much, they're tiny, the ones, are like they're sort of that big. So what you're looking for is this nice golden brown, soft texture. So just keep an eye on them. Um, and check them after sort of 20 minutes, and then if they are larger, keep going for another sort of 50, 55 minutes. And then over here, we're gonna make a very simple Meunier sauce. This is, I'm tweaking it slightly by adding uh, miso, which is obviously not, uh, not classic. Um, and what else is not in a classic miso? Wh which is it that goes in a classic miso? Is it parsley or chives? I can't remember, does anyone know? In a Meunier. In a Meunier. But parsley, okay, yeah. So in this one, we've got chives as well, 
which is one of my favorite herbs. You'll see me use it in many recipes. So we're just gonna melt down some butter. And you wanna slowly melt that until it starts to foam. So that might take a little bit. Just let that go. Maybe it'll turn it up a little bit. I'm just gonna have a quick drink of water. I hope you can't all hear it. <laughs> Sorry if you can. So I've never, before writing this recipe, I'd never actually made a munier, so, and I'd never really, I mean, I think I've eaten it once or twice, but I'm definitely not the expert, so this is, this very well might not be the right way, of, I mean, it's definitely not the right way of doing it, because I'm adding miso, but the, I think maybe in the classic version, you sort of flour a fish and then use that same pan, so there's a bit of flour in the pan, and that helps it thicken, I think. Um, but anyway, not in, this, not in this context. Like I said before, I'm a really big believer that there should be no rules when it comes to cooking. Although, I mean, having said that, I think there is a lot to say for keeping traditional things classic. So I do apologize to anyone who might be offended by adding miso to this, but it does just give it this beautiful, sweet, savory, rounded depth of flavor. So I'm just gonna keep that butter going until it starts to get a little bit foamy. And then, what am I going to do next? I think I'm adding the garlic next, right? Yeah. So again, this sauce would be so good in, in many different contexts. I think it would be really nice with grilled asparagus or even just quickly blanched asparagus. It would be really delicious over roasted quarters of cabbage. Um, obviously, it would be really nice with fish if that's what you're making. Um, or, you know, actually would be really nice with a mix if you did a dish which was sort of half fish and half veg all in the one plate, because I think that's the beautiful thing about plant forward. I didn't actually know about this movement before, um, before uh, coming here, well, before I heard about this summit, and I think it really is, it really is the way forward. And um, like I said before, I am an omnivore and I do love meat and fish, but it does make so much sense to make that less of the focal point in a dish. Um, because we all need to eat less fish and meat. Um, so I'm just going to give it... A, it's starting to brown, which is what I want. I'm not going to take it to like a, like a really browned butter, but I do want it to just slightly brown a little bit. Okay. I think I'm happy with that. And I'm going to just turn it all the way down because I don't want to burn this garlic. I want the garlic to become really nice. And what am I doing that? Sometimes I do really weird things that wouldn't. Anyway, um, so I just want this garlic to really softly fry. In fact, I feel like that butter's too, too hot, so I'm just gonna take it off the heat a little bit. I'm also gonna add some salt, which will help the garlic not to burn, because it will, it will make it release liquid. So I'm just gonna, in fact, just let that cook in the residual heat, because I think that's enough heat there. Um, that in a minute and then whoops I think I'm going in with miso and lemon juice next is that right yeah <laughs> I haven't cooked this recipe in a really long time okay I'm kind of happy with that garlic now so I'll add the miso and the lemon juice and I'm just gonna whisk that in until the miso is combined and slightly thickens the sauce And I love those sort of bits of brown butter on the bottom. I never really understand why well, you, recipes tell you to strain brown butter. I think the, those bits, that, those bits of protein or whatever it is, I'm not actually sure, lactose or protein, whatever it is, they're so delicious. So I personally never strain my brown butter. But again, that's a personal preference. You might prefer not to have those bits in there. So I'm just going to keep on whisking that until I'm happy that the miso has all been mixed in. Okay, I'm just gonna turn that back on and give it a little bit of heat to thicken it. I'm surprised that I, do, do I put pepper in this recipe? I can't remember. <laughs> there is pepper here, yeah. I put, I'm like obsessed with pepper, so I, I'm, I would be very surprised if I hadn't put pepper in it. 
Okay, so that's good. So now off the heat, we're going to add the capers, oh, chives, and parsley. And I can't remember if I put it in the recipe or not, but I want some pepper right now, so I'm going to do it. And stir that in. Ooh, that looks, smells so incredible. Okay, there we go. I'm going to stick this over here. No, I'm not. I don't know what I'm doing. Stick it here. <laughs> Great. So now we're going to lay these on. Mm, I'm going to pick one. Finish it with this beautiful sauce. And like I said, this would be so good with so many different vegetables. I think it would be really nice with asparagus and cabbage. I think it would actually be really nice with roasted carrots. Um, okay, so there we go. Give it a nice little clean. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty rustic cook, so I don't need things to look fancy. But I to just make the plate look quite nice. And then serve it with some lemon wedges for that extra bit of freshness. And there we have it. Um, kohlrabi steaks with, do you call them kohlrabi here? Yes, okay, kohlrabi steaks with miso munier sauce. Do I leave that here or should I move it? <laughs> okay. Kind of just want to like eat this out of the pan, but I'll definitely burn my tongue. So, um, yeah. uh, well, I was going to say we have a few minutes, so. Um, I wondered if you could just give us some insights to what you see in terms of plant-based, plant-forward cooking in the UK. Um, I know that you contribute recipes to that vegan article in The Guardian, and so it seems like maybe the UK is a little bit ahead of the US in that sense. Well, I, I guess I wouldn't be able to comment because I don't know how, what, what, how things are here, but certainly, in the last three, four years in the UK, um, we've seen a huge rise in, in people embracing that lifestyle and just so many more products in supermarkets. I was actually about eight, nine years ago, I was in a relationship with a vegan person and there was nothing other, you know, you'd, you'd have like soy yogurt, soy cheese, you know, like one or two fake meat things in the supermarket and that was it. And now. You go to the supermarket and there's stuff in every section. There's such a huge, um, huge array of things. I mean, I personally, the way I, again, this is absolutely personal preference, but when I cook vegan or plant forward, plant based, whatever you want to call it, I tend to avoid processed things as much as possible. So, um, but that's my personal preference. Uh, so I don't use a lot of fake meats or um, things like that. I mean, I, use, I prefer to just let the vegetables speak for themselves, um, use things like tofu, and, um, but that's my personal preference. But um, yeah, it's definitely, there's, there is, it's a huge, huge change in the UK um, and it's incredible to see. Um, it's, so, it's so embraced now. I remember, again, going back to my ex-partner, people used to sort of, not make fun of him, but they were just like, that's crazy, like, you're making some crazy lifestyle choices, and now it's so normal. And, you know, every, even if you're not vegan or plant-based, most people will have, like, oat milk or coconut milk in their coffee, um, and that really used to be, so, you know, you'd, he'd go in and ask for, like, a, a, a soy flat white or something like that, and they were like, what? But, yeah, so things uh, have really changed. <laughs> and could you... Um talk more about your cookbook and, and the thoughts behind that and, uh, you know, the concept for Mezcla. Yeah, so um, Mezcla, it means mix or blend or fusion in, in Spanish. Uh, and it's about, uh, it's about fusion cooking. So specifically about my, uh, the, the flavors that I grew up with. So my mom is Brazilian. Um, I grew up in Italy and my dad's father lived in Mexico for the last 30 years of his life. So Brazilian, Mexican, and Italian food was the kind of food, the kind of ingredients, the kind of flavors that I grew up with. And I've cooked since I can remember. I was always obsessed with food, always cooking. Um, 
And so I kind of just naturally gravitated towards the ingredients that I grew up with. So combining those was sort of second nature to me. So I wanted to create a book of recipes um, that reflected uh, my love for um, combining ingredients that might not necessarily make total sense. Um, the recipe book is not just about Mexican, Brazilian, and Italian fusion. Like most of my favorite recipes are, but there's also, um, I also have learned a lot for example, working at the Otengi test kitchen, I learned a lot about Middle Eastern ingredients and Asian ingredients, so there's a lot of those influences as well. But it's really just um, a celebration of, of, of mixing ingredients and, and being as creative as possible um, with respect. Um, I, I do, like I said before, I do believe that you know, there is a lot to say about tradition and traditional classic recipes not changing, but I also think it's really fun to mix things up in the kitchen and just to be as creative as possible. So that's what that recipe is about. And it's about hopefully um, inspiring your creativity as well. And you talk about that in the cookbook, about being able to do that with uh, respect. And so how, you know, for chefs who are looking at global flavors, how do you do that with respect um, to the cultures that you're uh, inspired by? Um, I personally think that, you know, there's, um, there's that really, you know, people always say there's that really fine line between appre appreciation and appropriation. Um, and when you're creating a fusion dish, if you're including elements um, or ingredients from a different culture, um, for example, the way I would do that in my book is that I, I cite the inspiration. I wouldn't ever say, you know, this is a recipe that I've come up with and it just came out of, you know, came out of my head and I've, you know, I really... Um, I cite my inspiration, I, I try as much as possible within the, within the space I have to, um, to talk about the history of those, those ingredients or that culture. So I think that's really important when it comes to writing recipes. Um, with restaurants, um, I would say, well, I mean, this is a really contentious subject, but I would say that um, if you are not of that culture and you're wanting to open a restaurant that is specifically f just one cuisine, that might be something you want to really sort of think about or at least make sure that you're working, that you're employing people from that culture and like, you know, using them, at, not using, um, but, but getting inspiration from them and making sure that they have a lot of the creative power there. Um, I would say that's quite important. But I think these days we should also have the freedom to use different ingredients from different cultures because claiming ingredients is also quite tricky as well. Um, ingredients have such a long history and borders are something that we made up as well. So, for example, Italy has only had tomatoes for, I think, the last three or 400 years. And I mean, just imagine what Italian food would be like without tomatoes. I mean, I'd find that really hard to imagine. but. They're actually native to, I think, I would need a fact check on this, but I think they're native to Peru. So, you know, you would think that tomatoes are Italian, but they're not necessarily. Um, and for example, Brazilian cooking, uh, which is my heritage, I find that extremely interesting because uh, a dish that a Brazilian person might think is a classic Brazilian dish is in fact a mix of indigenous Brazilian, uh, Portuguese and West African because more, more enslaved people were taken to Brazil than any place in the world. Over nearly 40 million enslaved people were forcibly taken to Brazil. So the influence of West African cooking in Brazil is, is incredible um, and that has to be respected as well. But ju it just goes to say that like something like a classic Brazilian dish, yes, you could call it classically Brazilian, but really it's a mix of Portuguese, West African and indigenous. So. I don't know where I'm going with this. I just think it, food history is very interesting. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's great. Thank you. No, yeah. and, and it just gets to the, the heart of your book. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that we're uh, looking at now uh, in the culinary world and we'll be talking about in our uh, Worlds of Flavor International Conference and Festival that will be in November. Um, so let's uh, join our hands together to thank Ista. Uh, such a wonderful, dynamic demo. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so exciting news. The roasted and pickled celeriac uh, will be available to taste. We'll have a 10.45 a.m. networking break. And then um, the roasted and raw cabbage salad will be served at lunch today. Um, and then let's see. Uh, all right, and so I'm gonna ask our next panelist to come up. And you're gonna give me one second. Okay, thank you. So if I could have Dave McLean, Roxana Julepat, uh, Luke Peterson, and Dan Saladino come up, that would be great. And if you all just want to take seats, um, I'm going to introduce, uh, so this next session, um, is reviving regional grain systems from farm to final product. Um, I wanted to let you know at the end of this, we'll leave some time for audience Q&A. Um, so that will be uh, using Slido, again, Slido on your app, on that home page um, to ask questions, and then um, to say hello uh, to our audience joining in through the live web webcast. I know. Um, the regional grains group uh, uh, across the country is so vibrant and so passionate, so a lot of them uh, had posted their, their uh, jumping in through our webcast, so hello to all of you. Um, and uh, our uh, colleague, Claudia, who is hosting the webcast, will drop a link in there uh, for you to go to Slido to ask questions. Um, so, uh, and again, for the people uh, who are joining the webcast, I'm Jennifer Breckner. I'm Director of Programs and Special Projects for the Strategic Initiatives Group here at the Culinary Institute of America. And uh, very excited to be talking grains. And do we have Dave McLean? Is he here? He texted me. Maybe he's getting coffee. OK. Um, uh, so this is the thing where I would text him. So maybe what I'll do is um, I'll do my intro, and then uh, we'll have Dan do some talking, and then I will text. Uh. But so anyway, so uh, my interest in convening this panel stems from previous work that I did in communications for Artisan Grain Collaborative, which is a group in the Midwest, and it's where I met Luke Peterson. Um, and most recently for the North American Craft Maltsters Guild. Um, and so thinking about how grains are a staple in almost every culture on the earth, um, but as we have all of this focus on uh, farm to table and eating local foods, that um, grains seem to not have fully come to the table yet. Um, but the people across the country who are Hello to Dave McLean. <laughs> Take a seat. Um, and this is how we're going to roll. We're a little, we're a little loosey goosey today. So, um, but so anyway, so it's to think about how and and, and uh, to share with you because these people are doing really important work and people across the country and really taking risks. Um, and building these regional grain systems. Um, and we're gonna talk about why that's important, why that's critical. Um, and uh, so today, my esteemed guests, we have BBC journalist Dan Saladino, um, who you saw present yesterday, organic regenerative farmer Luke Peterson from uh, Minnesota, Dave McLean, co-owner of Alameda's Californ Alameda, California's Admiral Maltings, and pastry chef, baker, and co-owner of Friends and Family in La Los Angeles, Roxana Julepat. And Roxana, you also have a new pizza place, is that correct? Okay, great. And so we'll talk about the culinary possibilities of grains. 
while learning how food and beverage professionals can support the regional whole grain economy and make these ingredients appealing to consumers. And then again, at the end of, uh, we'll leave some time for audience questions. Um, and so uh, we are gonna start, and I think I have some slides. And so Dan Saladino, um, hello, and is that his, Okay. Yep. Good morning. Okay, good. Oh, so let's, there we go. Um, so I'm going to give this to you. Sure. And then I'm going to ask you a question, but then you can jump into, and we're not just, is my, okay. So we're not seeing uh, the PowerPoint on the screen here, so if we could do that. Stand over here so I can see the image. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so I wanted to say, uh, to ask Dan to um, talk about the story of Kavalja. You talked a, a little bit yesterday um, and why it anchors your book. And then also to be able to talk about, you mentioned that food culture emerges out of these distinct varieties. And so if you could just talk a little bit about the culture that is tied to Kavalja. Mm. And I think we're going <clears> to <throat> have some amazing detail from, from my fellow panelists, uh, the application of, of some of the grains they're working with. So I'm going to take a big picture, more of a global um, overview, really. And I think, as you say, um, grains and um, in particular in, in the book, in that section, I, I include under that banner uh, wheat, and that's me standing in the Emma wheat field in Turkey that I mentioned yesterday. I know not, not all of you were here for the talk, but uh, I was just explaining about the origins, uh, the center of origin, uh, the Fertile Crescent, where um, the Neolithic package or originated, including wheat and barley. And that's me in Turkey, and a close-up of the whole Emma wheat there. And it really does anchor the story, because, I th and Jennifer mentioned it's almost the next big push really needs to happen with grains. But in, in a sense, that reflects the history of how successful the replacement of uh, grain diversity has been in the 20th century. And I mentioned that this location um, required, really, those farmers to persist, to continue with these uh, em emma wheats because the conditions um, really required an adapted crop. And I think that is the big picture for me, the fascinating and important big picture of a world and a future in which we need to think very carefully about changing our use of fossil fuels, application of fertilizers, other chemicals, water usage, all the challenges we face in terms of climate change, lots of unpredictability. And I don't think having a small genetic base of grains is going to be the way forward for the world um, and also for the big grain cultures of, of the world. When I came back from uh, Turkey, the person I went to with a sample from Turkey was, was this guy here, John Letts. John Letts used to thatch houses um, in England. So if you can imagine those quaint cottages with straw on. He used to repair those and came across a property that he was restoring in which there, were, uh, there was a thatch that hadn't been touched for 400 years. And he used that as, um, that was his clue into the past of wheat cultivation in Britain and traced all of the grains in his collection in this roof and then recreated a field of, of effectively medieval grains. So he became the leading expert and the, the main conserver of grain diversity in, in Britain. So I took these grains from Turkey, handed them to John, and this is a picture of him looking and then about to tell me these are some of the oldest grains I've, he's ever seen. He, was, he studied uh, archaeobotany at uh, University College London as well, so he, he actually spent time in Turkey researching uh, types of wheat as they were disappearing. Uh, um, in the center, um, three weeks ago, I was in the north of Spain. Uh, this is in Asturias. And this is a farmer 
who is urgently trying to save uh, a type of grain grown in Asturias for, for more than 2,000 years, and that's spelt. And what he's holding in his hand are the uh, tools that he and, and people would use to um, gather the, um, the grains, pull them off, and put them into, the, into a sack. And the reason why spelt is so fascinating is because in Astoria it's quite mountainous, lots of marginal land that you wouldn't be able to grow much else in. Spelt was perfectly suited and grew and still grows with very little effort or input. Uh, and it's mostly in the processing that the big challenge comes because these are whole grains. But I think this is a, the other important story that's unfolding now is the technology exists to process these ancient grains. Um, and uh, that's exactly what they're doing in Astoria, Spain. And this is a, that's a loaf of, of spelt bread and a 100% spelt cake behind it. Um, and there is a, a, also a really important intersection that exists now in, in the UK, and, and this is happening all over the world, intersection between people come, approaching this story from a culinary perspective agronomists who have the, the farming science behind them, and also the farmers and the processors. And the story for me in, in Eating to Extinction that really encapsulates that is bear barley from Orkney, and, and again, really harsh conditions in the North Atlantic, where the wind battles down most crops that you try and grow on the island, but bear barley, again, is just something about this adaptation that over many, many centuries of growing, it can survive in harsh conditions and the cold and the particularly challenging type of soil on this remote Scottish uh, island. And um, there is one mill left. And it's now being considered to be a, a crop of the future again. The, the, the nutrient density of bear barley it has been studied and is much higher than other grains. And um, because of the nature of the barley itself, it doesn't obviously create fluffy loaves, but there is a, 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 a renewed interest in the food culture and the food history of the Orkneys and these so-called bear bannocks, these flatbreads that you could find all over the north of Europe. And <clears throat> I mentioned here that as with the Kavalja wheat in Turkey, the soil on Orkney has very low levels of copper, magnesium, and zinc. And zinc. If you want to grow conventional barley there, and which has been done for the brewing and the whiskey industry, for example, or for cattle feed, um, then you have to put huge amounts of inputs in. And again, just thinking about the future, something that has been adapted over hundreds, if not thousands of years, is already something that can survive much better in those conditions without the chemical inputs. So I think it's a, a very exciting time. Um, it's a, a time in which um, a lot of innovation and research and investment is taking place on a very large scale, uh, ambitious, um, uh, in, in ambitious ways. I mentioned the Research Council in Britain investing huge amounts of money. And in some cases, crop breeders are taking wheat back through its evolutionary history to try and reclaim some of that lost genetic diversity for future adaptation. But what's fascinating to me is that those scientists are also aware that the system in which that crop exists also requires innovation as well. And so they are looking at the crop genetics but also thinking about regional grain systems. And that for me is fascinating because that brings in science, culture, economics, how, how communities can benefit from the type of grains that could be grown in their part of the world. So, uh, yeah, again, that's my insight into grain um, from traveling around and visiting these different grain cultures. That's great. Um, and I will take, actually, I'll do the clicker for you. Um, so, uh, so we have Luke Peterson from uh, Minnesota, and so we're going to play, uh, he has two videos. Uh, so the, fr uh, the first thing that I'll say is that um, if you are on Instagram, Luke has one of the best Instagram accounts that's out there. Um, it's A-Frame Farm, um, and I think that he takes so much of 
we don't, that we as non-farmers don't know about farming. And in a really um, educational and engaging way is able to just talk about these issues, talk about being a regenerative farmer. Um, you get to see his kids. You understand farming as a lifestyle. Um, and you just get to learn a lot about grains. Um, so I would suggest that you follow him. But so we're going to play two of these videos back to back. They're super. It's like a minute each. And then, Luke, I'm going to ask you after that to talk about, you say that you have a systems approach to farming. So what that means, um, uh, how it is different from conventional agriculture, and why you feel this is the best approach. So let's watch this first one. I'm standing out in an open field, uh, annual cropping system with no covers on it. And uh, the field is blowing away. I can't hardly stand out here with my eyes open because there is so much dirt in the air. It might be easy to uh, at this distance, but if you look across, there's a haze of soil that is leaving these farms. Now this is all of the good parts of your soil. This is the black topsoil. This right here is what we need to feed a growing population. And it is blowing away. It's blowing away. Hello? Hey. All right. So um, I am a farmer. I do not use technology that often, other than unless it's in a tractor. So I'm not the best at sending videos, but I think you get a pretty clear message there. The first video um, is business as usual. Uh, the second video is our farm. And I guess I'll maybe go into an introduction. Uh, just. Luke Peterson, Madison, Minnesota, uh, certified ROC uh, grain farmer. And um, we are trying to build a model that works for people, for the land, and for the community. Um, that has brought me into, uh, well, it's brought me to a lot of different places. Um, it's brought me, like, really close to um, my community. Um, and my, when I say community in a business aspect, I live about three hours from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, when I first started down this path, I wanted to have a crop rotation. And uh, anyway, I think too hard about things sometimes. So in order to do that, what I wanted to do, uh, what I needed to do, was I needed to build a relationship with people that were using alternative grains. So I'd get my pickup. And um, I just had this aha moment where I was transitioning from conventional farming. I farmed conventionally for two years. My background was that I worked for the Department of Natural Resources. And I worked with six people that had, uh, you know, six-year degrees in ecology, the environment, zoology. And they educated me on how our ecosystem works. Long story short, I had my first daughter. I needed to figure out how to make an income uh, from home. That pushed me into farming. I left 
conventional farming two years in because of the business model that was behind it and the practices that I was doing. And I couldn't ignore what I had learned at the Department of Natural Resources. So I quickly went into organic farming. I got into organic farming and I realized that the industrial model is pushing really hard on that system as well because the demand is so high. Uh, after two years of farming organically, I went, I, got, I pushed really hard into regenerative agriculture. And um, what, that, what that means, what's the difference between organic and regenerative? Um, what the regenerative aspect is doing is they are keeping the original fundamentals of organic alive and well. Uh, so organic started out a certain way, the demand grew really fast, farmers couldn't keep up with it, and we started doing things a little differently than how we first intended on them being done. So the regenerative is just the basis of what organic kind of started as. It's try trying to create a closed loop system um, on your farm, uh, you know, using your management school, uh, skills versus trying to buy off farm inputs to take care of your problems. Uh, and the basis of the regenerative, uh, in my opinion, needs to be people. So we always talk about soil health and we talk about um, water infiltration, carbon sequestration, things like that. But like my definition, uh, what I see is the most important piece of the regenerative versus the organic is that we include people first and then we do the other things because we need people, right? Like, just, like uh, molsters and bakers uh, before we're going to get any change on the landscape to happen. Um, so, uh, that's once again, uh, <laughs> what was your question? No, no, <laughs> that's perfect, that's perfect. But I just feel like there's so much involved that I'll go down some rabbit trails. Um, and, and I think next year it will just be a three-day uh, global plant forward focused on grains. Uh, That'd be great. <laughs> so we're going to go to uh, Dave McLean next. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and play a video. It doesn't have any um, sound. But I wanted to say, so Dave, when I um, was first putting this panel together, for Global Plant Forward and mentioned that I wanted craft malt to be part of this, I had a colleague who pushed back and said, what does that have to do with this conference? And I say that not disparagingly, because then I reached out to Dave, and Dave said, are you sure you want me to come to this panel? Um, and then I, th I think about when we had our call, and you had said one of the challenges for you as a craft maltster is getting brewers to know about what you do. So there's this kind of not knowing about what craft malt is from, from the public, but all the way down to the people that you are working with in the industry. Um, so as I play this video, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about Admiral Maltings, what a craft maltster does, um, and how you are connected to barley, and other plants that you're malting, and that sort of uh, connection that you make with farmers. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, I, I have, I mean, malt and, and brewing and distilling are kind of, you know, food adjacent, um, but obviously it's all coming from the same place, from the land. And uh, in my own, you know, entry into this world, um, you know, included kind of both, because I started as a brewer, but a brewer with a restaurant, and um, I've always had restaurants attached to my breweries, and, and even now with our mall house. So um, sometimes the inspiration for the beer side has actually come from the food side, because, you know, the farm-to-table movement is so well-established in food, and then I'd walk through the kitchen of our restaurant and not, uh, you know, and, and, and see amazing local food, and then go down to the brewery, and, and it was basically commodity malt. So we set out to, uh, two brewers and a, and, and a farmer set out to start a malt house in, in California to change that. And, um, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, the, you know, the malting process is, is pretty simple. It's just taking raw grain, usually barley, and, and modifying it uh, through germinating it. And, um, and that's what you're seeing on the floor here. So, you know, Admiral Maltings uh, employs a traditional, very old, old, almost archaic practice of making malt, which is floor malting. Um, you know, to, to germinate the malt, we spread it out on a floor, 
in a very thin layer and essentially have a sort of a controlled growing process where we're trying to trick it into thinking it's a plant in the ground, a seed in the ground, and it wants to become a new plant. And that triggers a whole bunch of changes in the kernel, and that's what the brewer and or distiller wants um, to, to be able to brew or distill with. So, you know, we, we created this, this malt house uh, to, to change the way brewers and distillers in California think. Um, and, you know, as Jennifer said, there's a public component too, because not only do, you know, a lot of brewers not really have not in the past historically thought a lot about where their grain comes from, uh, but a lot of consumers don't really think too much about it. If they think about one thing about beer, they think about hops these days, because that's kind of where the conversation and narrative got directed. Um, but beer is a grain-based uh, product, you know, it's its 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 definition. So, you know, a big part of, of what we, what we want to do is connect brewers and distillers with the farmers and hope that that connection uh, trickles uh, well, through the, us as the middle person, the maltster is the middle person, right? We take the grain from the farmer, um, and then, you know, the brewer distiller produces a product, and, and then hopefully the consumer ends up kind of coming along for that ride, too, and really understanding that this is not just, a, you know, a, a, a manufactured process um, of, you know, beer or spirits. Um, you know, it doesn't just happen in the brewery or distillery. It really starts in the field. It starts with the farm. It starts with who grew the grain, how they grew it, where they grew it, um, and there's kind of a so-called functional terroir where it's not just, uh, you know, the, the, the plant genetics and the farming practices and, and, and weather, but it's also with the maltster's input too, uh, the variables that we control to kind of create that malt. Um, but it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's um, in, the, in the beer world and, and in the distilling world. Um, it's not, you know, people, have, people historically bought their grain from uh, a wholesaler and it just happened to be whatever one or two or three commodity or industrial large-scale malts those those wholesalers supplied so there wasn't a lot of opportunity to think differently about it and therefore a lot of brewers um, kind of just fell into a, a rut of this is how we order our malt and they, they kind of look past that to the hops and fermentation characteristics and all the other inputs that go into brewing um, but you know kind of leaving behind the grain part which is how it all starts so that's you know, what you saw was, was a small local mall house of, of which there are about, you know, several dozen now around the country, um, you know, using traditional methods uh, and super small batches to, to try to change the way people think about beer and spirits. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, and then the next question for uh, Roxana. So in your book, Mother Grains, Recipes for the Grain Revolution, you offer that the local grain movement didn't appear out of thin air, and I know you're really passionate about talking about the supply chain. So how did it materialize? Where did it come from? Who's driving it? And how did you come to be so passionate about it? He's a tough act to follow. Um, he's very eloquent. Uh, let's see. So, well, before I got to be a full-on baker, I was a pastry chef for about 15 years. And I always worked with my husband, who is a chef. So our conversation was very around seasonality and very, very ingredient-driven. So we were super avid uh, farmer's market shoppers. And we had very intimate, close relationships with our local farmers in Los Angeles, uh, to the point that we know their kids and their parents and we've been to many of their farms and uh, kind of like can predict a little bit of what they're growing and when things are coming, even a little bit with this sort of thing that climate change is doing to um, the growing seasons. And eventually somebody's gonna bring grain to a farmer's market and you're gonna be like, if you are that focused on ingredients, you cannot possibly ignore the quality of your flour at some point. So it kind of became very hypocritical how we were all saying like, we're farm to table and we are so seasonal. And yet we are bringing all this super processed, refined flour, super sifted and put it in our bins. So that, that was the start of it. And then I met some really incredible people, uh, the majority of which are women, uh, not something that you would necessarily expect and particular here in California, with a few in very incredible players in the East Coast, most notably Glenn Roberts uh, from Anson Mills, and then um, Monica Spiller from um, the Whole Grain Connection in Arizona, now in California, and then, of course, my local Miller, who's now like my sensei and my Obi-Wan Kenobi, and her name is Nan Kohler, 
And you, the reason why these names are important is because as a baker, we could not talk about whole grain bacon without having this sort of like one-on-one -on -one relationship with our, with our community, right? So as much as I wanna like preach to my customers, uh, I find most of my energy seducing my supply chain. <laughs> like, please, <laughs> please send me grain. Um, and you know, I need so many parts between the farmer and me to click so that I can bake that um, it really is a never ending process. So um, I always talk about this sort of like um, hiking the, the, the grain trail as if it was sort of like the PCT, right? Um, unfortunately, it's not sort of like a continuous road, and it's more like a, we're like hopping from one pinpoint to another. Um, but there is sort of like this sort of connective tissue. And right now it's a very thin membrane. But at times you feel like there's more like solid muscle building. Um, and of course, it requires sort of like more people trying to bake this way or mold this way or cook this way so that we promote farmers like Luke to grow it more. And, you know, venues like, I'm gonna say it, don't hate me, Whole Foods to like require more, um, uh, uh, push the market to uh, provide more of this grain. Um, and then hopefully we get to see names that we're not familiar with, like Spelt, like Sonora Wheat, which is so important to California, like Red Five, like uh, Scottsbury Barley, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's, did I answer the question? Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> and so I, I wanna ask um, uh, one question to Luke. We talked about uh, local versus regional when it comes to grains. And you said that you don't think the concept of local grains is in the mix yet. And so can you, can you talk about that? And even just uh, in terms of when we, we have this phrase, buy local, um, and that, that really kind of doesn't apply to grains, does it? Yeah, like big picture. I would say it's a very small movement right now. We're at the beginning of it. Um, education to the consumer, and just, it just takes a while. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the hurdles that I think are, we're going to run into as we move forward with local grains. Um, I do believe it's going to happen, and at scale, hopefully, um, it all come down to what you know, what you guys put on your on your list or on your plates or things like that. But um, kind of some of the hurdles that we run into that we have run into, that we've overcome, are cleaning and processing. Um, another one is flavors. Another one is consistency. Uh, my whole business uh, lives and dies on whether or not people like these guys have the know-how <clears throat> to use what I deliver. I have no control over the you know, weather. I have no control over when I plant, which will make my product vary greatly. But there's some tricks that these guys have up their sleeves. Whereas when I deliver, they will say, great, this is unique in its own way, and we will work with it and make it happen. The commodity sector does not work that way. So, if we, so we're gonna need everybody here that is creative and uh, you know, like have, has the skills to work with these uh, variable grains, I think that'll be one of the biggest challenges that we overcome is just the, um, you know, the knowledge that it takes to be able to tweak ingredients and, or to tweak recipes and processes and things like that. Um, and then it's to scale, right? So like right now the cleaning facilities or the dehulling facilities, I grow emmer on my farm. Uh, when I first started, I was selling 2,000 pounds of emmer at a time and that was a lot of emmer. Uh, when a cleaning facility, when I talk to them, they need seven semi-loads of grain before they'll even start the process. So I was standing at the local cleaning facility's door, you know, begging, pleading, like, hey, could you fit me in? And it's like, well, what are you cleaning? Emmer. And they're like, we don't know what that is. And so there was an education there also that had to happen. Um, 
And then another thing is the, like the risk that we're, we all take on, right? Like, is the consumer gonna like the end product? Um, you know, there's, there might not be crop insurance to back up the growers on these alternative grains. Um, so there's kind of a list of things that we kind of got to pick away at. And I think the best way to do it is if everybody here focuses on kind of telling your experience with the process or what you experienced and how you made it work or what didn't work and what did work. So. And then Roxana, you uh, talked about this because, you know, we have uh, a group of industry people here. We're the Culinary Institute. So we're focusing on flavor and how to use these grains. And I know that Roxana will have a kitchen workshop tomorrow where some of you will get to really dive into this. But uh, you had talked about the, the sort of hurdle that bakers think that they have, that maybe they don't have. But also then, um, can you talk a little bit about engaging with the consumers? The consumer is the easiest part. Uh, uh, so a little bit of background. So Friends and Family is my bakery. It, uh, we opened in um, East Hollywood five, six years ago. And if you know LA, East Hollywood is not the pretty part. Um, but it's definitely my energy, and I thought it was a perfect uh, stage for what we wanted to do. Um, we set a basic goal that 20% of the flour content, at least, of every recipe had to be whole grain. That was six years ago, and, and that's it. You know, like, so imagine you have this binder of recipes, like many of you have, I'm sure, notebooks from all the restaurants that you work at, from cooking school and all the little clippings from recipes and your grandma's little notes. And then you slowly convert those to um, incorporate some level of whole grain. And as you play around with whole grains, you're gonna have favorites. You're gonna have really good results with some of the things. Um, the, uh, some cornmeals are gonna be your favorites. You're gonna totally crush so hard on buckwheat, you won't believe your luck that this grain exists. And then you imagine you have to like now open a bakery and this is, this is your ingredients, right? So like your purchasing list becomes from like four kinds of flour to 25. And that's what we do, right? So um, it is more on our end, on our bench and on, on your team than it is on the consumer because I mean, we're not hacks, you know? We're gonna do a good job. Like, we, we know what we're doing. Like, what I really, really appreciate about whole grains is that because they are so same-ish, but yet so different. Like, you understand starch, you understand germ, you understand bran, and you know what they're gonna do, because we're cooks and we know what we're doing, but they are going to present challenges. So you're gonna have to be so mindful, so present, so focused on the process that it actually is gonna make you a better baker and a better cook. Um, it also will add fun to the process, like especially if you feel a little bit burned out on what you've been doing for a little while. This will inject an incredible amount of energy and creativity, like nothing you've ever done before. And um, and you know, you will, will make, you will make amazing delicious food so what that's all the customer cares about um there is a price issue i'm sure you know you 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 have ish, um you have to convince sometimes people to pay a little bit more for your grain than what they're paying for commodity flour i think currently uh organic sonora wheat is three dollars to 20 cents versus commodity flour in California. So that's, that's a huge difference, but that is on us. So it's like on us as bakers and um, business owners to make the decision. Do we wanna like hustle it and like really, really try and be creative and like get, get down to do some hardcore recipe development and put up with the price and see what, where that takes us uh, and, and, and not worry about customers. Customers will buy your stuff if it's, if it's delicious. They don't need a, uh, a crazy convincing marketing scheme. Great, thanks. Um, and so let's talk about flavor, uh, continue to have that talk about flavor and terroir. And so Dan, um, you, uh, in your book, you're talking about this connection between geography and climate. 
um, varieties of grains and how kind of recipes sort of come up through that. Um, so I wondered if you could uh, just talk more about how that process, these diverse uh, biodiverse sort of varieties shape traditional recipes in cooking. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I, I kind of touched on this with the uh, story of, of bear barley from the Orkneys um, and these, these flat bear bannocks which people survived on for a thousand years and uh, making a revival now because they are delicious, because there is a, a local supply chain, because there is some scientific evidence now about the ability of it to grow. But um, what I've found fascinating in, in terms of the deep history is thinking about that story of the Fertile Crescent and these wild grasses being domesticated over a long period of time, conscious and un unconscious selection by humans interacting with these grains. <clears throat> and then as those humans spread out to different parts of the world, um, we now think that oats and rye, for example, traveled with the wheat and the barley as weeds. So there would have been so much intercropping that one field would have contained so much diversity. And as these seeds traveled with humans into new areas, traveling into Europe, for example, they would have taken the, the, this package with them. And in that would have been the, the rye and the oats and the barley. And as they move further north, and obviously there's climatic change that happens over thousands of years as well, so periods of warmth, periods of cooler temperatures as well. The further north the farmers travel, the less uh, well the, um, the wheat perform, and the, um, <clears throat> the more suited uh, the northern, northern conditions are to the barleys and the rye, for example. And so not only is the environment dictating what can grow, but obviously that's influencing what can be baked and cooked and prepared. So the emma wheat that I encountered in Turkey, for example, um, that isn't baked into a loaf. That's cooked almost like a pilaf, as a, as a grain uh, that you would then eat with dark or, or goose. <coughs> Uh, and likewise, in, in Northern Europe, you would not have had loaves of bread. I, I, I um, uh, made a radio program once in the north of Sweden with uh, chef uh, Magnus Nilsson uh, of Favakan. And we, we traveled to his home village and we baked, uh, or he baked, um, flatbreads. And that was the, the tradition of the area because of uh, the kind of grains that, that grew there. So I, I think, and, and the, the beauty of that for me is it's a story of diversity. It's a story of genetic diversity of these different crops, the diversity of food and farming systems that spread around the world, all reflected in the different foods that people eat. Thank you. And then, uh, Dave, I wondered if you could elaborate. You mentioned functional terroir. And what does uh, terroir and provenance mean in terms of flavor when you're pr you know, producing malt for a beer spirit? Well, yeah, I mean, functional terroir kind of is a way to, to describe, you know, I guess like I said before, um, you know, that confluence of all the plant genetics, which variety are we asking a farmer to grow, um, which is gonna pr presumably produce some expected results, <laughs> though it could vary by weather and, and other conditions. Um, and then, you know, the farming practices, uh, as well as the weather, and, uh, and the growing conditions. And then, you know, what do we do when we get our hands on that? And so each kind of step of the way, there's sort of a series of, of, uh, of, of changes that occur in the, in the grain. You know, the, the biggest changes are affected by, by us because we're, you know, we're, we're actually really changing the grain, we're modifying it. Um, you know, we're germinating it and, and then we're kilning it. And, and in both those steps, we're really, the flavor kind of comes out the, 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 the sum of all of those inputs and, and the different spots on that, in that sort of circle of functional terroir, comes to life in the kiln, the last step of malting, which you, you, know, you saw in the video. Um, throughout those earlier steps, um, you know, different, different, pr different compounds are formed, different, different, different components of the grain are formed, you know, more or less of each one, depending on the genetics, depending on the farming, uh, depending on how we, you know, handle and manage germination. And, 
then we sort of take all of that and put it in the kiln and, and, and create sort of a recipe for how we make a particular style of malt. And the time, temperature, and humidity in the kiln are going to act upon those various compounds that are in the grain um, that were you know, set at the levels they're at based on those different, different uh, steps along the way. And that's going to that's gonna coax out a set of flavors and aromas in the kiln. And it's going to be totally unique based on all those other inputs upstream. Um, and so, you know, for the, long, for the longest time in beer, especially the modern industrial era of beer, um, the decision of what kind of grain, what variety to plant, um, you know, was often more of a, a conversation just between grower and maltster. You know, what's going to work best for you, the farmer? Um, and, and what's going to, you know, what can we work with based on that to turn it into good, consistent uh, malt that can, you know, be brewed with and distilled with. Um, but now that we have this, we sort of opened up the floodgates, right? And so we have, you know, the, the data points were small. There were just a few maltsters and a few varieties of grain. Um, not that many brewers either. Um, now we're kind of including brewers in the conversation and distillers and saying, you know, these, these different choices we make and the farmer makes um, and we make with the farmer are all potentially going to going to affect um, flavors and, and, and aromas that you can expect in your finished beer or your finished uh, spirit. So it's, it's sort of a new frontier of, of mix and match and trial and error. You know, some grains are going to grow, you know, some varieties that have been tried and true and workhorse varieties in the west of the United States, maybe when they get planted in the Finger Lakes region in New York, they don't perform or behave the same way. So maybe there's, or vice versa. Um, you know, does, the, does that particular variety prefer more or less wet, you know, conditions, things like that. So those things all trickle back, trickle down to flavor and aroma. Um, and, and, that's, and that's sort of what functional terroir is. It's this, this idea that we have all these levers we can pull, and if we pull them together in the right way, in the right order, um, we can influence the flavors of the finished thing that the, you know, the, the brewer or distiller is making. Well, thank you. And so uh, I think we're going to go to questions now, and we have a lot of great questions. Um, and so uh, there is a question for you, Luke. How uh, can those of us here find farms using regenerative practices, and how can we best support them? In other words, how to be less transactional and more impactful? I think like uh, going to like a organic farming conference, or just a farming conference in general, you would meet a lot of uh, a lot of farmers that are trying to work towards the right work in the right direction, um, and then once you do start, if you do start working with somebody and then you build a relationship and you both trust each other, um, I think the main thing is that you know a ro you know like the rotation we have or the practices that we carry out, it's such a long term vision, and really what we need are long-term partners. And that's kind of the, the main thing. So. And then we also have this question uh, bringing us back to plant-based cooking and food security. Can you speak about the importance of feeding grains directly to people instead of livestock first? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so like resiliency is kind of the, the name of the game with our system. Uh, like on all levels, like having relationships with people that we know uh, builds a lot of resiliency into the system. Having a crop rotation where some crops might fail but some are gonna flourish every year builds big resist, you know, a lot of resistancy. The crops that he's talking about, like, like Emmer for instance, the, when I first transitioned, I had to eliminate synthetic fertilizers. So I, was, I planted Emmer because it uh, didn't need the fertility that these crops that are you know, they are bred for yield. So the, you know, the commodity wheats or grains or whatever right now, the universities are coming out with grains that yield. They don't taste good. You know, they need uh, chemical inputs, synthetic inputs, all geared towards yield. I planted Emmer, it was eye height and it waved, I had 25, 30 mile an hour winds and I got nervous, I went and stood out in the field and it was waving at eye height, laying on the ground and standing back up. I had no fertilizer. I had seed that was not genetically modified. I put it in my bin and I planted it again the next year and it was still the same beautiful crop that I had the year before. So there's resiliency in that. You know, I don't have to depend on a large system or supply chain where I don't know anybody in it. 
you know, if I, if I build my own supply chain and know everybody in it, we're going to be a lot more resistant to weather events, climate events, uh, lots of things. So. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question for Roxana. Many, of here, many here rely on recipe standardization for our operations. How can we best embrace the nuances of local grains and variability yet be consistent? Yeah, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I am a baker and I do measure everything. And Ixta earlier today was saying how she doesn't like recipes. Well, you know, uh, as bakers, we rely on recipes. We need formulas, like everything in baking relies on a formula. Is there flexibility in a formula? Yes, of course there is, you know, and not only that, I guess like the fact that we tell ourselves like, oh, baking is a science and it's so exact, puts us in a corner, right? Like um, if we allow ourselves to think about where can we sway and what is going to happen, you know, um, assuming that certain variables are the same, uh, your change of grain is gonna affect the recipe, but not, not dramatically so in a way that you're gonna be like so disaster prone. So, of course, all of this to say that if you really, really, really don't know what I'm talking about and don't know where to start, all you do is try, it, let's say, uh, one of my favorite uh, flowers to start with when you are like, okay, lay it on me, whole grain, what do I do now? go get a, ba a bag of spelt, whole grain spelt, right? Use it as your whole grain flour. First thing you make, chocolate chip cookies. The same chocolate chip cookies you've made all your life, right? Do a one-to-one. -one. The cool thing about spelt is like it truly behaves like a, an all-purpose flour. Just that experience alone, pay attention, just that experience alone will give you so much feedback and information. Cookies are great because guess what? They're flat, right? Now, step two is a cake. Is that cake gonna sink or not, right? So the one thing that we have to acknowledge is like what makes whole grain different is the fact that we have every part of the kernel in there. So you have the bran and that means that you have a little bit less starch, right? That bran is occupying, but for volume, more space than starch, right? So if a, a, one cup of all-purpose refined flour has more starch than one cup of whole grain flour. So w uh, one more thing that is important about uh, bran to know is that it absorbs more liquid. So there's a couple little tweaks for be beginners that I recommend. One is like to cut back a little bit on um, the amount of whole grain flour, and my amount so far is 10%. And I tell you this because I'm writing a second cookbook and this has worked so far. I'm in chapter one, so I still have a chance, a chance of failure, but um, I'm like 30 recipes in and like that 10% seems to, seems to work well. It works the other way around. You can increase your amount of liquid by 10%. Do, do be careful though, because sometimes we think liquid is eggs, right? No, liquid is more like say water or milk or buttermilk and things like that. Great. And that 10% is by weight. Um, we have another question that asks, uh, with so much focus on anti-carbohydrate, keto, and paleo eating styles, what techniques do you use to educate people about the importance of whole grains? Hmm. All right. I get in fights with people all the time. <laughs> mm, I think that the one thing, I think if there is nothing you come out of here thinking like the one piece of information is um, I feel like we need to look at whole grains or grains in general as a, in a whole different light. Um, we put them sort of like in this pyramid, right? Where we have to eat, I don't know, what was it? The American diet pyramid at some point was like 90%, then it was like 1%, I don't know. So I, I started to look at grains as sort of agriculture and uh, think of them as produce. And in doing that, it really changed my perspective of how you incorporate them into your diet. Um, it's also 
I can't imagine how someone would ever talk about being plant forward or plant based without relying heavily on grains. Grains are not only carbohydrates, Grain, grains are also protein and a gazillion minerals. Um, so when somebody asks you what about carbs, you just tell them what I just said and like they're confused and <laughs> <laughs> they don't care anymore. <laughs> Well, so uh, we're going to end right now, and uh, we'll end with uh, a super easy question for you all. Um, which grain has the most potential to be the next kale? <laughs> or, or which grain are you really excited about? Well, I want to say I, I, um, I, I think I should be the spokesperson for sorghum. Sorghum board anywhere, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm available. Uh, so I, the reason why I like sorghum is um, when I wrote Mother Grains, I focused on eight grains. Um, my mission was to focus on, uh, focus on eight grains only that are very important for us domestically here in the, in the United States. I have a background, um, my family's Thai and Costa Rican, so I lean heavily on rice and corn. Um, ancestrally yet, you know, for, for us here in the States, we have such, I mean, this is the, the epicenter of grain. We live in the land of grain. Um, but sorghum has such a rich history in the United States, and it has been uh, perceived as a grain of the poor, but it is one of the most nutritious grains. It is incredibly healthy. It's uh, like the most climate friendly grain and there is not enough recipe development out there for sorghum. So homework for everybody, start cooking with sorghum. Syrup or grain? Sounds great. And the rest of you, do you have a favorite grain as we say goodbye? <laughs> well, I mean, in the, in the beer and spirits world, we're fairly limited to barley as our primary grain, but we do malt wheat, uh, rye, and oats, and we're just starting some experiments with malting corn. and. Um, I think that's going to be, we're excited about it because it's going to be a big change uh, in the world of distilling, especially because a lot of distillers use um, unmalted corn and convert the starch with enzymes that they add. Um, this is a, they may still need to add some enzymes to get the proper starch conversion, but having malted corn, malt, because like I was saying before, malting brings out flavors, uh, especially through that last step of kilning, having malted corn is like a whole new tool in the toolbox because it's going to have a different set of flavors associated with it uh, than raw corn. And so it's going to potentially change uh, bourbon distilling, especially because that's a high corn mash. Um, so it's just, it's what we're working on right now. We have a distiller who's been asking us for it, which is how these things happen because we have to be able to sell this stuff. And so um, having this distiller, in, one in particular, but others have asked, but having one so hot and heavy really hounding us, like when are you guys going to malt corn, has us really like experimenting with getting it right, um, it's, it's a complicated process, but um, it's pretty exciting because it's a whole new thing for us to be working with. Uh, I would say, so on, on my days off, my side job, we are starting a uh, perennial foods cooperative and we are trying to bring perennial um, grains to market right now. And the one that I see that has the most potential going forward is Kernza. Uh, Kernza was developed at the, you know, in Kansas at the Land Institute. Lee DeHaan is the current breeder. And um, anybody that's nodding out there, like, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep doing your research on these new perennial grains. Uh, but right now, Lee DeHaan, this last summer, um, he made a statement, and I don't care if he's half true. Uh, he said that Kernza will compete or out yield annual wheat in 17 years. If he's half right, uh, it'll change agriculture. Uh, Kernza right now is low yielding, um, but if we focus on yield as a culture going forward, we are gonna run this planet into the ground. Um, Kernza has a root system that goes 12 feet deep, and it has the capacity to store carbon deeper than any other crop that's on the market. Um, and it's gonna store it at a level where we can't dig it back up when that crop goes back into, you know, comes out of its rotation into another crop. So I would say Kearns has got a lot of potential. And I, I want to pick up and amplify the sorghum idea because I think uh, this, this is the year, the U UN year of millets. So a celebration of these tiny, tiny grains that are so nutritious 
uh, they can grow in um, conditions with uh, much less water. Uh, and, you know, I think so much diversity of flavor as well is there for, for, for all of us to discover. But I, th I think we should reclaim all, all grains because how... I mean, this, this blows my mind to think that this is... We're talking about the food that created the cultures and civilizations of the, of the world. And yet we've created a, a system where we've turned it into a commodity and we've processed these grains to extract all of the goodness and then distribute them uh, for people to live on poor diets. And I think we just need to remind ourselves of the importance historically of this grain that changed the world, changed us. And we should reclaim those grains and celebrate them and reclaim the goodness as, as you're doing here. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's such a perfect place to end. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Dan and Luke and Dave and Roxana. Um, we uh, will be taking a short networking break where Vishwesh Bhatt and uh, Roxana are going to sign their books. And uh, Vishwesh is leading a kitchen workshop in the afternoon. Um, Roxana is leading one tomorrow. You're, you're all lucky uh, folks who get to be in those uh, workshops. We're going to meet back here in Ecolab at 11.15 a.m. for a discussion on fermentation with Jason White and Mara King. Um, so thank you so much.셰프 김병진입니다. 오늘 준비해드린 메뉴는 배김치, 그 다음에 그 곤드레 솥밥 두 가지를 준비했는데요. 배김치 같은 경우는 약간 한식의 김치를 그냥 서양 음식의 크린저 같은 역할을 할수 있는 게 무엇일까 고민했을 때 약간 아무것도 첨가되지 않은 그냥 순수한 발효한 맛의 김치를 약간 좀 응용해 보겠다 해서 만든 김치입니다. 그래서 백김치를 만들고 백김치에다가 아 배에다가 백김치를 채워서 만든 음식이라고 생각하시면 편할 겁니다. 근데 특이한 부분은 백김치 그냥 단독으로 사용하는 게 아니라 거기에 이제 들어가는 국물 같은 경우는 동치미를 따로 만들어서 이제 약간의 배즙을 계속 조금씩 조금씩 추가하면서 유기 그 산에 약간 활성화 시켜서 만드는 국물을 첨가하는 부분이 조금 다르다고 할수 있습니다. 감칠맛을 내기 위해서 뭐 다시마 육수를 쓴다거나 아니면 뭐 설탕이나 그런 거 최대한 자제하고 뭐 양파나 그 다음에 뭐배 같은 걸 써서 감칠맛을 높이는 역할을 조금 함, 합니다. 그리고 대부분 백김치 같은 경우는 그 우리나라 지역적으로 보게 되면 약간 온도의 편차가 있기 때문에 약간 위쪽 지방에서 많이 사용하는 김치긴 한데 양념이 많이 들어가지 않습니다. 약간 밑에 지방으로 들어가서 따뜻해지기 때문에 약간 양념이나 뭐 맛들이 조금 자극적이라면 그 지금 서울이나 서울을 중심으로 해서 위쪽으로 갈수록 양념이 적어지는 경향이 있습니다. 그래서 그 재료의 순수한 맛을 발효시켜서 낸다고 보시면 조금 편하게 이해할, 이해가, 이해가 될 겁니다. 음. 곤드레 같은 경우는 이제 뭐그 봄에 나오는 나물 중에 하나이긴 한데요. 봄부터 여름까지 나오는데 예전에 한국 같은 경우는 먹을 게 많지 않았었기 때문에 약간 좀 약간의 국물에다가 나물들을 써서 죽 같은 걸 많이 먹었었는데 정선 쪽에서 그 곤드레가 많이 자랐는데 약간 바람에 흔들리는 모습들이 술 취한 사람이 걸어가는 곤드레 만들이 채서 걸어가는 그런 거랑 비슷하다고 해서 이름이 그렇게 지어졌고 약간 그 나무를 채취를 해서 약간 그 상태로 먹게 되면 은 밥에는 다 풀어질 수 있는 부분이 있어서 삶아서 한번 건조를 하고 다시 물에 불려가지고 양념을 해서 볶아가지고 밥 안에 집어넣고 해서 약간 식감 있게끔 만든 나물 밥이라고 생각하시면 편할 겁니다. 특이한 점은 저희는 이제 매일매일 쌀을 도정을 합니다. 그러니까 쌀 같은 경우 도정하고 나면은 이틀 정도가 지나고 나면 약간 향이나 맛에서 약간 조금 그 최상급에서 약간 떨어지기 시작하기 때문에 저희는 이제 예약 인원수에 맞게끔 매일매일 도정을 하는 부분이 조금은 다르다라고 할수 있고요. 그 다음에 한 번에 많이 짓는 게 아니라 그 나갈 수 있는 양만큼씩만 
따로 소수해서 바로바로 바로 밥을 짓는 것도 약간 조금 차별화된 점이라고 볼수 있습니다. 그리고 곤드레 솥밥 같은 경우도 뭐 다시마 육수나 아니면 야채 육수, 채소 같은 걸 해서 육수, 밥을 짓고요. 따로 여기서 사용되는 모든 솥밥 같은 경우는 거기에 어울리는 육수를 사용해서 항상 밥을 짓고 있습니다. 우리가 만약에 이 식당을 해서 한식을 한다고 했을 때 어떤 흐름으로 갖고 갈 것인가에 대한 고민했을 때 그러면 한식에서 가장 최고는 무엇일까 생각할 때는 예전에 조선 음, 조선 궁중 음식이었던 거예요. 그러니까 왕은 어떤 음식을 먹었을까? 거기서 시작이 됐던 것 같아요. 왕 같은 경우는 아침에 일어나자마자 약을 먹었어요. 탕약을. 그러니까 잠들어 있던 신체를 깨우고 어떤 기혈들을 오픈시켜주는 역할로 해서 모든 영양분이 퍼짐으로써 이제 하루의 시작을 맞이할 수 있게끔 하고 그 다음에 항상 그 수레상만 먹는 게 아니라 뭐 죽상도 먹고 그 다음에 뭐 어떤 면상도 먹고 하면서 가장 마지막 밤에 먹는 부분들은 그냥 그냥 큰 상으로 봤을 때 항상 밥이 중심이 있었어요. 그러니까 나머지 찬들도 많이 있겠지만 결과적으로는 이 찬은 밥을 먹기 위한 부분이었었는데 이유를 보게 되면 아침과 우리가 자기 전까지 에너지 흐름이랑 거의 비슷하더라고 생각을 했었어요. 그래서 어떻게 보면 잠들기 전에 약간 조금 단맛으로서 약간 뭐 약간 릴렉스 할수 있는 그런 부분 이전에 마지막 이제 신체적으로 에너지를 보충하는 역할로서 밥을 사용한다고 보시면 조금 편하실 것 같아요. 약간 아시아권은 채식 위주의 어떤 식사들이 굉장히 많았었기 때문에 굳이 막 채식을 하, 해야 되겠다라는 것보다는 그냥 어떻게 밸런스를 맞출 거에 대한 초점이 훨씬 더 강하지 않을까라는 생각이 들어요. 서양보다는 뭐 육류의 소비량이 많이 늘었다고 하긴 하지만 아직까지 채식을 하는 그 그러니까 약간 같이 먹는 비중이 높기 때문에 음 굳이 막 채식에 대한 이런 부분들이 외국만큼은 아직 막그 불지 않는 부분들이 약간 그런 이유이지 않을까라는 생각은 갖고 있습니다. 많은 사람들이 그 채식을 하게 생각하면 딱 떠오르는 게그 불교. 그러니까 종교적인 부분을 또 많이 생각을 할 거라서 약간의 건강을 생각하는 것은 마음의 수양을 위한 음식이라고 생각하는 부분이 조금 더 강할 수도 있다는 라 생각은 저는 개인적으로 갖고 있습니다. Today, we're making this delicious vegan flatbread with roasted mushroom sausage and red peppers. I'll show you some plant-based techniques for building intense umami flavor for this flatbread. We'll start by making the cashew parmesan. In a food processor, add the raw cashews, the nutritional yeast and garlic powder, and some salt. Pulse to your desired consistency, then set this aside. This cashew parmesan is a very simple and versatile topping and can be used on pasta, salads, soups, risotto, tacos, and more. Next, we'll make our plant-based roasted mushroom sausage. I have some roasted mixed mushrooms that are chopped and mixed in with a dairy-free risotto that I've made using Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Vegetable Base. It's easiest to work with when the risotto is slightly overcooked and cooled. Pulse in a blender until combined, but not pureed. Pour the blended mushroom and risotto mixture in a separate bowl and mix in the following. Some slightly overcooked wild rice, dried thyme, granulated garlic, fennel seeds, ground black pepper, and salt. Mix these ingredients well. Now we're ready to put the toppings on our pizza. Top the prepared dough with some tomato sauce made with Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Base. Add the small balls of roasted mushroom sausage. Add roasted red peppers, followed by sliced shallots and sliced fennel bulb. Transfer the flatbread to a 500 degree oven on a preheated pizza stone and bake for about six to eight minutes. Remove the flatbread from the oven and sprinkle with the cashew parmesan. Top the pizza with some arugula tossed in olive oil, salt, and pepper. Cut and serve your flatbread with roasted mushroom sausage and red peppers. Meat lovers and vegans alike will love this flavor-packed pizza.